I'm Peter Gaggi, I'm a research fellow at IOHK and uh, we are now at uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts and I'm going to give a talk on Ouroboros and Ouroboros Prowse which are two proof-of-stake uh, protocols uh, that uh, underlie the Cardano project. Ouroboros is unique in uh, being the, the first proof-of-stake protocol with uh, provable security guarantees uh, being, uh, being published in a peer-reviewed conference, Crypto 2017. Uh, provable security is an is an approach that is uh, being adopted by uh, by uh, cryptographers in academia for decades already, and uh, uh, it's a way to design protocols uh, where, as opposed to trying to just uh, design them in a in a best effort way, you instead aim for a clear. Uh, security guarantees that can be mathematically proven in a rigorous uh, computational model. A provable security treatment of the protocol consists of defining the model in which we look at the protocol, describing the protocol and defining the uh, required goals that we want to achieve with this protocol, and then giving a mathematical proof that this protocol actually achieves these goals in this model uh, against an arbitrary adversarial behavior that uh, the model allows. Thank you very much, Amy, for the kind introduction. So yes, I will be talking today about uh, Ouroboros and Ouroboros Prowse, uh, the two proof-of-stake algorithms that uh, uh, one of them is underlying Cardano already now, and the second one is uh, uh, potentially uh, might replace him at some point. Uh, and first, let me mention that uh, the whole line of work on Ouroboros blockchains is uh, joint work with uh, Agelos Kiaias, Alex Russell, Bernardo David, and Roman Olinikov. And, uh, Actually, these gentlemen are the authors of the first uh, Ouroboros uh, paper, and I joined the team when we started working on Prowse. Uh, I will be talking about both of these uh, protocols, uh, and also I would like to acknowledge Alex for, uh, for um, creating an older version of these slides that will be used throughout the talk. Uh, so the roadmap for today. So I will be first uh, very briefly talking about Bitcoin and proof of work, although we all have an overview of how, how this roughly works. It's just to uh, just to make sure we are on the same page and to be able to draw comparisons later. Then uh, what follows out from this first part is that uh, this is not the end of the story and uh, this motivates why we want to look at the proofs of stake instead. Uh, and then I will spend most of my time uh, talking about how Ouroboros works. I will describe you the, uh, the model in which we look at how Ouroboros works and in which we prove the security guarantees. Uh, I will uh, describe how the protocol works and I will try to show you some details uh, from the security proof of the protocol. Uh, so this will be more of a theoretical look at, at Ouroboros. And then I will uh, also talk about Prowse briefly uh, by describing the differences from Ouroboros and uh, how this helps us make Ouroboros better, uh, namely uh, secure in a semi-synchronous setting and with adaptive corruptions. Uh, I will talk in detail about what this means. Uh, so let's start with Bitcoin and proofs of work. Uh, we uh, all know this uh, uh, this part. So, so um, Bitcoin, as we all know, is a cryptocurrency that uh, appeared in 2008, at least the proposal. Uh, and what was novel about Bitcoin is the is the the idea that of a decentralized ledger mechanism that is being maintained in a permissionless setting. So anyone can enter this, the uh, the setting, uh, participate in the protocol, uh, and uh, uh, this was possible due to a novel security assumption, namely the majority of adversarial computing power. Uh, sorry, the, uh, the assumption that uh, majority of the computing power is controlled by honest parties. Th this is the, the crucial security assumption that Bitcoin is uh, uh, relying on. Uh, of course, it, uh, it uh, inspired a huge amount of uh, follow-up work, and there, are, uh, uh, there is a huge amount of cryptocurrencies that came to, uh, came to exist after Bitcoin. Some try to aim for uh, richer uh, uh, transactions, name, uh, which are often uh, called smart, smart contracts. Some aim for better privacy, and some aim for different consensus mechanisms. And uh, actually, a different consensus mechanism is what I will be talking about mostly. Uh, but uh, from a theoretician's perspective, the first question you should ask and needs to be asked when you look at Bitcoin is, uh, what problem does Bitcoin solve? And uh, uh, this, this question wasn't rigorously asked for quite some time and uh, uh, later uh, this was formalized, uh, mostly in the GKL work, 
and the, uh, it turns out that the, the question is how, to, how a distributed collection of parties uh, can agree on a dynamic, a dynamic evolving sequence of transactions, which we will call, call a ledger, uh, in such a way that it uh, maintains two properties. The first one is called persistence, uh, and it means that uh, any transactions that already entered the ledger will be immutable. Uh, and the second one is called liveness and means that uh, uh, if I want to include a transaction into the ledger, eventually this will, this will happen. This is a, an informal description of a, a property that can be cap captured formally. And of course, it's parameterized somehow to, to give some uh, concrete meaning to this eventually. But uh, this is the intuition. And this all should be happening in a setting when parties can, uh, can join and, uh, and uh, leave, leave the execution of the protocol. And we have to account for some uh, parties that might behave adversarially and try to disrupt the protocol. And uh, the way Bitcoin goes about this, uh, of course, is by storing this ledger in a data structure called a blockchain, which consists of a genesis block that is uh, agreed upon at the beginning. We assume that everyone agrees upon how this, this genesis block uh, looks. And then a sequence of blocks where each of them contains some transactions and also uh, a hash of the previous block. So it commits uh, this, this particular block commits to the entire history of transactions in Bitcoin. Uh, and of course, the major challenge in Bitcoin and in cryptocurrencies in general is how to uh, achieve consensus on changes, on extending this blockchain. Uh, and uh, the interesting, uh, interesting point here from, from a theoretical perspective is that this is outside of classical distributed computing models because it no longer makes sense to speak about uh, majority of players. Uh, this is due to the Sybil attack, which we all know, right? Uh, if, if it costs you nothing to enter, the, to enter the space and there are no identities, then you can just create as many, as many players as you want if you try to disrupt the system. And the solution that uh, Bitcoin uses to, to overcome this problem is a combination of two things. So the first one is proof of work. Uh, so uh, as you all know, uh, a block in, uh, in Bitcoin looks like this and it contains a work nonce, which is a proof that whoever created the block invested a particular amount of work. And uh, uh, this uh, certifies that, uh, that the work was invested. And uh, the second uh, part of the solution is the longest chain rule, uh, which means that if I'm a party looking at the um, at potential candidates for, for the state of the, of the ledger, I will simply choose the, the, one that, uh, the, the one chain that I see that is the longest uh, I have seen so far or at, at least contains most work. Um, so in a very simplified cartoon version, Bitcoin works like this. You, if you are a node, you, what you do is you just simply repeat the following. You collect all the pending transactions. You collect any, uh, any chains that you have seen on the network. You adopt the longest one uh, out of those uh, as, your current valid, uh, as your current state. It, uh, I mean, of course, it has to be valid uh, in terms of the transactions that it contains and other things. Uh, and then you simply try to mine a new block on top of this chain by trying to solve this proof of work. And if you succeed, uh, you, you add it to the blockchain and you, you broadcast it to, uh, so that uh, everyone can adopt it as well. Uh, and uh, what, what this, this whole procedure achieves is called eventual consensus. Uh, because if we have an adversary that, uh, that tries to compromise the persistence, for example, he might try to uh, to remove a particular, a particular transaction that is in one of the blue blocks uh, from the ledger, he would have to create an alternative uh, blockchain uh, or an alternative fork from the blockchain uh, that would have to be longer than, than the major one. And uh, of course, this is, uh, this is highly unlikely if he, doesn't, uh, if he only controls a minority of the, of the computing power. This is a uh, cartoon version of the main security argument of Bitcoin. And this means that the deeper the blocks are, the, the increasingly immutable they are. Uh, but uh, another way how to see this, see this is that this actually yields as an implicit mechanism for uh, leader election. So you can see all these people that are uh, doing the mining, doing the, trying to complete these proofs of work as uh, competing in a leader election process where the probability of succeeding, which means being able to extend the chain, is proportional to the computing power. Uh, what is nice about Bitcoin is that, first of all, it is simple. Uh, the protocol is much simpler than uh, previous protocols uh, trying to achieve consensus in, uh, in uh, uh, permission settings, for example. Uh, 
and it neatly solves this challenge, uh, uh, how to achieve this consensus in a fluid population of participants. Uh, but also, uh, and, and also with uh, pre uh, previous impossibility results, which uh, told us that something like this should not be possible, are sidestepped thanks to this uh, ingenious new assumption of, uh, of honest majority of computational power. Uh, and uh, actually, it's amenable to formal analysis, which uh, already happened uh, to some extent in academic literature. So there is uh, Gara et al. In 2015, gave gave an analysis of Bitcoin in the in the synchronous setting, then uh, Pass et al. in uh, in the semi-synchronous setting, and uh, Badecher et al. at Crypto 2017 gave a EUC EUC based uh, characterization of uh, of what Bitcoin achieves. So that's all good and nice, but uh, we wouldn't be here if, if this was the final answer. And so Bitcoin also has some some disadvantages, and the main one. Uh, is the computational race that is necessarily happening to, to maintain this proof of work. Uh, because this, this assumption of honest computational power, uh, honest uh, majority of computational power, that's, it's essential for Bitcoin security. And so as Bitcoin grows, uh, the need for, uh, for uh, computational power being wasted in, terms of, uh, in the process of maintaining the ledger also increases. Uh, and this can actually, to some extent, be quantified. It's hard to get precise numbers, but the estimates are on the order of uh, uh, of single units of gigawatts uh, being needed for maintaining the the Bitcoin network, which uh, roughly corresponds to uh, uh, powering a, a million U.S. homes or an entire country, as you can see in the news. Uh, but what is, at least for me, more worrying about this is that these estimates are growing uh, due to the growing popularity of Bitcoin. So, uh, for example, it almost tripled over the last uh, six months uh, as the price has soared, and uh, this doesn't seem to be sustainable in the long term. And uh, remember that security of Bitcoin crucially relies on this. So clearly, from a, from a theoretical but also from a practical pers perspective, uh, a very important challenge is to try to replace proof of work uh, with some other mechanism. Uh, and if we if we try to aim for a for a re, for a similar mechanism where we which we also can see as a lottery uh, uh, or a um, leader election mechanism, uh, we would uh, what we would like to do is to do this election based on a different resource than computational power. There there are actually several proposals trying to to do this. Uh, there were proposals looking at uh, disk space as being the the resource to be used. Uh, maybe useful computation as opposed to the useless computation that is being uh, used in Bitcoin, maybe useful storage of useful data. But uh, I would say that the most appealing approach is to, instead of all these real life resources, try to use uh, uh, an abstract resource. And uh, clearly the, the choice of the abstract resource would be, would be to use the the coin itself, the uh, owning of the coin itself. And this is exactly the line of thought that leads to to proof of stake, uh, the, the topic I will be talking about. So, so basically, proof of stake is uh, is uh, this approach of uh, shifting this uh, election process uh, to a, to a setting where your probability of winning is proportional to the uh, to the to the fraction of the of the currency that you own. Uh, this has several advantages because, uh, as you know, the, the the ledger already contains the information about. Uh, how the how the currency is distributed among the participants. So basically, the first uh, idea how we could do this is just simply in in steps always elect the smallest uh, unit of the coin uh, and just try to look who owns it and let this guy be the be the leader. This would lead to uh, participants being elected leaders proportionally to the stake that they own. Uh, this was actually proposed in the context of Bitcoin as well, and that's why. Originally, it was called "follow the satoshi" by the the smallest unit of uh, of account in Bitcoin, and uh, uh, from a high level pr perspective, it looks awesome because we just got rid of the need of the physical resources uh, that would underlie uh, the election process. But otherwise, nothing needs to needs to change, right? Uh, except that it's not so easy. Uh, so the main challenge in, when you want to design the the I mean, there are several challenges, but the main challenge when you want to design a Proof of stake protocol is that uh, for this election that I just described, you need some randomness uh, to elect, for example, this coin and what I described. And this randomness, the 
this randomness needs to be unbiased, uh, unbiasable by by the parties involved, potentially malicious parties, and this is this is really crucial because as soon as, soon as the adversary can bias the randomness, uh, he can bias the election process and he can try to hijack the whole chain and uh, bad th bad things happen. Uh, so the first challenge is how to how to produce this randomness. Uh, the first Stroman proposal that was actually uh, even implemented in several uh, uh, existing cryptocurrencies and uh, that comes uh, to your mind if you try to think about it is that, okay, the blockchain already contains some effectively randomly looking data, which are the, 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 block, uh, the hashes of the blocks. So one thing you could do is just try to hash the blockchain uh, as far as you see it for now. Then this will identify a particular coin and uh, then this will somehow identify its owner and this owner is uh, allowed to create the next block. Uh, that sounds good, it just doesn't work. And the reason for this is well known, it's called rejection sampling. Uh, what the adversary can do if, if uh, he gets into a position of creating a block, he can try to locally uh, test whether if he creates a particular block, what would be the outcome of this process. And if it turns out that the next, uh, the next le elected leader would be someone else, he just discards this block and tries again. And he does this locally until he, he's lucky and, uh, it turned, and until the outcome of this process is that he would be the leader of the next block again. And then he can do this on and on and basically hijack the chain. Uh, so this is obviously unacceptable. Uh, this is called a grinding attack. It's one form of it, it's a simplified one. One can see many variants of this. And this is mostly to illustrate that it's uh, not as easy to to make this idea work as it would uh, look at first sight, and there, there are actually a lot of subtle challenges in, in it. Uh, I will now list some of the, some of the constructions that, that uh, deal with this problem and give some rigorous guarantees in terms of, uh, uh, of security of the, of the proof of uh, stake protocol. Uh, uh, Uroboros is the protocol that I will uh, talk about, and uh, uh, now I'll just sketch how, how, how these protocols deal with this particular challenge of getting randomness. So what Ouroboros does, it's, it, it implements a secure uh, multi-party computation uh, to generate the randomness. I will go into the details later. And this actually gives us uh, clean randomness uh, unbiased by the adversary, as long as some assumptions that I will detail later are satisfied. A different class of protocols, uh, Snow White and Ouroboros Prowse, they choose a slightly different approach. They do use hashing, uh, uh, which is what I described before, in a, but in a much more careful way. And they do, uh, do give a rigorous analysis that, uh, that this uh, grinding attack actually can be, can be contained and uh, uh, the randomness can be used, uh, can be used for staking without, uh, without uh, jeopardizing the security properties of the blockchain. So uh, it's, uh, uh, hashing is used, and, uh, and then by a careful analysis, we can show that uh, this doesn't, doesn't do any harm. And uh, in this place, I also uh, have to mention Algorand, which, uh, which actually predates uh, all the proposals above, uh, but, uh, but uses a different approach. Uh, so I will not uh, uh, have, have a chance to go into details of, of that in the talk. The, the approach is uh, that um, contrary to the above constructions, which aim for a for an eventual consensus, just like I showed you, uh, aiming for uh, the longest chain rule and accepting the longest uh, chain. Uh, Algorand simply, uh, simply tries to uh, get a, a complete consensus uh, for every block. Uh, uh, but why I mention it here is because, uh, because it still needs randomness for, uh, for its running. And so it has to address similar problems and it does it in a similar way to the, to the uh, constructions in the second bullet, namely, namely uh, it's, uh, does use some hashing and it does uh, an analysis that shows that uh, grinding, uh, the, the effects of grinding are, uh, can be contained and, uh, and uh, limited. Uh, there were also several solutions of proof of stake in the wild, so I will just list them here. The, the NXT cryptocurrency, Peercoin, uh, DPoS that uh, seems to be underlying BitShares, Steam and EOS. Uh, there is discussion about Casper at Ethereum uh, and so on. Uh, so let me let me talk, uh, let me now move to the to the main part of the talk, where I will try to to give you some insight into how Ouroboros works, uh, in what model we analyze it, and uh, how we try to prove it's secure. 
Uh, so from a really top level view, uh, Ouroboros is a protocol uh, that uh, assumes uh, synchronous time and communication. So we, we look at it in a synchronous network model. This is something that, uh, an assumption that will be relieved in Prowse, but for Ouroboros, this is, this is how we analyze it. And it does provide persistence and liveness, the two properties that I told you about that we, we care about. Uh, it provably achieves persistence and liveness under the following assumptions. Uh, we assume that the adversary controls a minority of the stake throughout the whole execution of the protocol. Uh, we assume that uh, uh, corruptions from the adversary are not immediate, so there is some, the adversary might corrupt parties, but there is, a, there is some delay in this corruption. Uh, this is also an assumption that can be alleviated uh, in Prowse, uh, and we do it in Prowse. And uh, stake shifts are happening at a bounded rate, so this seems like a practically reasonable assumption. We are assuming, for example, that not all the stake will transfer from one account to another one, uh, within a single transaction, and uh, there is a bounded rate of how the stake shifts. Uh, so let me detail a bit about the communication model. I said it's a synchronous model. Um, uh, we assume that participants have synchronized watches, and we split all the time into slots. Uh, for example, in the Cardano implementation of Ouroboros, one slot is 20 seconds, just uh, so that you can imagine a particular number there. Uh, and we assume that all messages that are being sent by players, by honest players, are received by all the other honest players in the same slot, so within this, this 20 seconds. Uh, this is the synchronicity assumption of the model. Uh, a property of the protocol is that all the parties only uh, communicate by broadcast, uh, which in practice is implemented by peer-to-peer -peer, uh, gossip, gossiping. But uh, we give the adversarial parties, uh, so any parties corrupted by the adversary, <coughs> we give them the power to send arbitrary messages to arbitrary subsets of the players and arriving at arbitrary times. So this is the communication model. Uh, so let's now take a look at how the protocol, how the protocol works from a, from a top level view. Uh, it's divided into epochs. Uh, each epoch is, uh, R, uh, is a sequence of R slots, so it's a particular time interval. Uh, this would be the colored uh, boxes down there, the, the big ones. Uh, as you can see, each of them consists of several blocks that were produced in this epoch. Uh, and within each of these epochs, uh, we need something that is called a stake, staking distribution. This will be the distribution that will be used to sample the, the winners of the election process. Uh, and the way we, take, uh, we obtain this stake distribution for a particular, so for example, for the for the yellow epoch, we, we obtain the stake distribution by simply, simply taking a snapshot of how the assets are distributed in a particular moment in the previous epoch. So in this case, it would be in the blue epoch. Uh, and except for the stake distribution, we also need randomness. Uh, and the randomness is produced in the previous epoch, epoch by a multi-party computation. So during the blue epoch, there is an MPC running, uh, which uh, leads to leads to a, an unbiased, probably unbiased randomness that is then used in the yellow epoch to, to sample the, um, the winners of the election. These are called slot, li slot leaders in Ouroboros. Uh, so this, uh, for every slot, as I told you about these slots, for every slot we uh, elect a unique uh, player that is allowed to create a block in that slot. Uh, and and the, the sequence of these, uh, of these players the slot leaders are, uh, is called a leader schedule, and that is sampled uh, using the state, stake distribution and the randomness that I described to you, and that come from the previous epoch. So this, this circle of epochs that uh, um, each of the epochs relies uh, for its stake, stake distribution and randomness on the previous epoch, this is how Ouroboros looks from a, from a very top level perspective. Uh, and if we want to analyze the security of Ouroboros, then uh, well, if I want to tell you something about it, uh, I will go in. The, uh, I will approach it in the same way that we do in, uh, or that it, uh, it is done in the paper, uh, which is doing it in two steps. First, looking at one single epoch, uh, assuming that the stake is static because it's, there is a, just a fixed uh, stake distribution that is being used for sampling the slot leaders, and the randomness is clean and given at the beginning. This is called a static uh, static setting, for example. Uh, and then I will tell you how to bootstrap to, to analyze the whole protocol and the sequence of these epochs. So first, let's take a look at the static case. Uh, 
we assume that uh, there is a genesis block that uh, that contains uh, the public keys of the players together with their stake uh, with their proportional stakes uh, these are given at the beginning and shared by all the players and we also assume that there is a sufficiently long clean random string for the leader election uh, and now we are going to look at uh, one particular epoch of length r and uh, try to show that uh, during this particular epoch persistence and liveness is achieved uh, so as I said, uh, in this static case, the leader selection uh, is simple. Uh, there is just a public, uh, publicly known function L that uh, takes the randomness of, uh, uh, that is to be used for, for this epoch and generates all, uh, all the leaders, the, generates the whole sequence of uh, the whole leader schedule in such a way that each leader is selected independently from the other leaders and proportionally to its stake. This is what one would expect. Uh, and since the function L is public and the randomness is public, the whole leader's, uh, leader schedule is public as well. So everyone uh, knows the leader schedule in advance. Uh, then we can talk about uh, when is a blockchain considered valid. Uh, it has to start with, a, with the genesis block that is agreed upon, everyone knows it. Uh, it has to contain a sequence of blocks, of course, that are uh, uh, associated with increasing slot numbers and each contains a hash of the previous one and uh, they contain known conflicting transactions. Uh, but what is important is that there doesn't have to be a block for each of the slots because maybe the, the unique slot leader that was uh, chosen for that particular slot uh, did not produce a block. Maybe he was malicious, maybe he, uh, he was offline for whatever reason. So we consider the chain valid if, uh, uh, e even if there are slots w uh, without blocks. Uh, but each of the blocks has to be signed by the leader of the slot uh, to, to which this, uh, this block uh, claims to belong. This is important. And that's why the structure of the blocks in Ouroboros is as follows. It contains, of course, the transaction, the hash of the previous block, uh, and the slot number. But on top of it, it also contains a signature that comes from the, from the secret key that corresponds to the public key uh, that is present in the stake distribution, right? So the stake distribution is simply a distribution of stake over public keys, and then this can be used to, to verify that uh, the block was actually signed by the proper, proper uh, slot leader for that particular slot. So the protocol uh, uh, in the static case looks as follows. Uh, again, the, the, uh, the party collects all the transactions that it sees on the network and collects all broadcasted blockchains. It adopts the longest one. Uh, as its current state, and then if the party uh, 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 figures out that, it, uh, that uh, she's the leader of, uh, for, for the particular slot currently happening, it just creates an additional block, signs it, and broadcasts it to, uh, broadcasts it to everyone. Uh, uh, and this block is, of course, created on top of the longest chain that the party has seen so far. So you can see that deliberately, and by design, this protocol is very similar to what is happening in Bitcoin. Uh, although we got rid of the, of the proof of work aspect and uh, the election looks different. In particular, it's important to, to observe that uh, it's also a longest chain rule protocol. So we do have this longest chain rule that governs which, uh, which chain is to be considered the current state. Uh, however, the analysis is, uh, uh, is different in many or in several crucial aspects from Bitcoin. Namely, in our setting, the, the adversary uh, in contrast to the Bitcoin adversary, uh, has several additional uh, powers at, the, at its disposal. First of all, it, uh, he knows the entire sequence of leaders ahead of time, because as I said, it is public. Uh, and and uh, second of all, uh, he can generate multi multiple blocks per every slot where he is the slot leader, because this is, this is basically for free. It only costs you one signature to generate a block. Uh, so this, this extends the powers of the adversary. Uh, that's not the case in proof of work where you have to work hard to, to create every, every block. And so an obvious question is, how much does this increase the power of, of the adversary? And can we prove that it doesn't allow him to disrupt the security of the, uh, of the blockchain? What, what the paper does is it introduces a framework to describe uh, the combinatorial behavior that is happening when, when we are extending this, uh, this chain in this, in this manner that I described to you. Uh, with some slots belonging to honest parties and sl some slots being controlled by the adversary. Uh, so to talk about this, 
uh, we, will, we will use the notion of a characteristic string, which is basically just a binary string, a string of zeros and ones, that, uh, that describe how the slots are distributed among honest parties and the adversary. So it's a string of R uh, bits, and the zero always means that the slot leader for the particular slot and that at that position is an honest party, and one means that it's, a, it's an adversarial party. Uh, so you can, you can notice that this string in the execution of the protocol is just binomially distributed with the parameter 1 minus epsilon over 2, where, uh, uh, where this is the, the, the relative stake of the adversary that, uh, uh, that we assume in the, in the, in the, in the distribution, of, uh, in the stake distribution. And the hope would be that uh, S uh, as the adversary controls a minority of the stake, it will also control a minority of the slots. Uh, so um, uh, less than one half of uh, the bits in this bit string will be, will be one. And the hope is that this is sufficient to observe that, uh, that the dynamics of the protocol as it will be happening uh, will, uh, will lead to persist, will achieve persistence and liveness. Uh, uh, so let's see, let's see how to go about that, how to, how to actually show this. Uh, so as I said, the goal is to, to show persistence and liveness, but it is well known that uh, in blockchain-based protocols, uh, one can actually show three more basic properties, common prefix, chain quality, and chain goat. And these three properties together imply both persistence and liveness. This, uh, this is from the GKL15 work, uh, where common prefix simply means that any two chains possessed by any two honest parties, uh, potentially at different time uh, moments, uh, have the property that if you cut k, the final k blocks from one of the chains, it will become a prefix of the other one. Uh, this is common prefix. Uh, chain quality is a property that shows that, uh, that says that uh, any chain possessed by an honest party has the property that at least one of the blocks within the last k blocks uh, was honestly generated by an honest party. And uh, chain grown, growth simply means that uh, there is a lower bound to the, to the growth of the chain at every, at every sequence of, uh, say, k slots. Um, actually, it turns out that the most difficult property to, sh to prove for Ouroboros, but also I think in, in general, is common prefix. And so I will talk a bit about how this is achieved and then very quickly, quickly gloss over the other two properties. Uh, so, but to get some intuition, let's, let's take a look uh, uh, at an example of how the dynamics of the protocol works. So let's imagine that uh, we have this epoch with, uh, what, nine slots, and we have, a, we have an agreed upon uh, genesis block, uh, and we have a characteristic string down here. I remember that zeros re mean that the, this is an honest, uh, honest slot, so the slot leader for that slot is honest, and one means that, uh, that the, the slot leader is adversarial. So what can be happening? So the first slot leader is honest, so he follows the protocol and he simply creates a block that extends the longest chain, which is just the genesis block. That's easy. Then it's adversary, at, then it's the turn of the adversary, and uh, of course he can, he can just uh, create a block that does not extend the longest chain, but uh, creates a, an alternative uh, chain. Uh, then it's an honest player's turn again, and uh, as we know, the protocol says that the honest party should extend the longest chain available, uh, the longest chain it has seen so far. But in case there are several chains of the same length, uh, to be on the safe side, we, uh, we, we let the adversary decide which, which of the chains will be extended by, by this honest party uh, to, be uh, uh, yes, to, be, to be on the safe side in the analysis. So for example, let's say in this case, the adversary makes the, the honest party extends this upper chain uh, then it's adversary's turn again. He can do something like this, for example. Then it's an honest party's turn. But what, uh, and maybe the honest party extends this one because both of the chains were of the same length. But then what the, what the adversary can do is uh, only at this point creates additional blocks that belong to its, uh, to its slots. And then uh, use these blocks to convince the, the next honest party to extend this new third middle chain, right? Uh, then it's uh, adversary's turn again. Uh, maybe, maybe he doesn't use his slot, and in the next one he does produce a block, as you can see in the, uh, in the slides, and finally makes the, the, uh, the, the last honest party extend this, this longest middle chain. So what we can see from this toy example is that the dynamics is already 
uh, far from trivial even in this uh, simple static setting. And uh, what different paths in this, in this tree that you can see uh, correspond are basically different histories of transactions. So, uh, and even here with a, with a minority of, uh, of adversarial slots, the adversary was able to create three of them even though they are of different lengths. And so we would like to, to show that it can never happen that uh, the adversary manages to create uh, two alternative histories that have forked uh, sufficiently far in the, in the past and, uh, and are of equal length, because then basically the, the honest party doesn't know which of these histories to believe and, uh, and persistence is clearly violated, uh, right? Uh, and to be able to show this formally, there is a, there is a forks calculus introduced in the paper uh, where we formalize this, uh, where this notion is, uh, is formalized. Uh, we talk about a fork, which is, which is just a name for, for such, a, such a tree as you can see up there, uh, and which is an abstraction of uh, what were the chains that were being uh, sent around by, by parties. So it's a graph that indicates these, these uh, chains. Uh, nodes, of course, correspond to blocks. Uh, edges correspond to this uh, predecessor relation. We have a genesis block there. We, uh, we, this, uh, these double circled nodes correspond to honest blocks and uh, single circled one correspond to adversarial blocks. Uh, all nodes are labeled with the, their slot number, to, with the number of the slot that they belong to. And uh, each node has a unique edge, of course, to a previ previous uh, node with a smaller label. Uh, what is important to, to notice is that uh, according to the protocol all play and to the according to the model, all players hear all uh, honest broadcasts and all honest players speak at most once in any slot. And what these two observations uh, mean for the, for the graph is that any honest slot is associated with uh, exactly one honest node. Uh, and the, the, the depth of uh, any honest block exceeds the depth of all previous honest blocks because if an, an honest party broadcasted a block, then any later honest party will not be willing to exceed, uh, to extend a chain that would be shorter than the one that this honest party already uh, broadcasted. This is uh, due to the synchronicity assumption of, uh, of the broadcast. Uh, so formally a fork is a, for a particular characteristic string W is a labeled rooted tree uh, where each node is labeled by, uh, by an element from zero, uh, from zero to N and uh, it satisfies the four conditions that the, the root is labeled with zero, uh, edges are directed away from, from the root, uh, labels increase along uh, each of the paths, uh, honest slots, so the slots that belong to, uh, uh, that have a zero in this characteristic string, they label a unique vertex and the depth of the uh, honest vertices increase. And any, uh, any tree that satisfies this for condition is, a f is called a fork for the particular string. So if we fix a string, there is a large set of forks that can potentially occur uh, as the dynamics of the, of the protocol evolves. And we want to argue about all of these forks. Uh, and so the idea when we want to prove common prefix property for the, for the protocol, uh, our goal is to show that uh, if we start by choosing this characteristic string from this binomial distribution that I told you about, then the probability that common prefix will be violated is, is small, is negligible. But uh, the way we want to go about it is to actually show that if common prefix would be violated for this particular string, it would mean that a very, very obscure uh, fork uh, uh, has, has occurred. So the, the graph has ver some very unexpected properties, namely, Namely, there are two widely diverging paths. So there are two long paths that have uh, diverged from each other a long time ago. This, this would be necessary for, for a violation of common prefix. And so we can try to just uh, show in a combinatorial way that uh, over the probability of sampling this characteristic string, uh, with overwhelming probability, we end up with a string uh, that doesn't allow a fork that would have this, this undesirable property. So none of the forks that are admissible for this particular bit string uh, would have this, this undesirable property. And this is the way we want to go about it. Uh, to ju just show that uh, this is not, uh, this, this is far from uh, straightforward. Uh, 
um, okay, so first, first definition, we call a, a string, uh, such a bit string, we call it forkable. If it has this property that there exists a fork, there exists this graph, this, uh, this tree, that uh, has two, uh, two paths that are of maximum length within this fork, and uh, they, they diverge at the beginning, so they have no, no overlap except for the genesis block. And uh, here is a particular example, int an interesting one, where we have nine, uh, nine slots, uh, three, three honest ones, then three adversarial ones, and then three honest ones again. Uh, so the adversary only controls one third of the, of the slots, but uh, what it can do is, okay, let the, let the honest guys do their job, then create a, an alternative uh, path of length three, let the, uh, let the final honest guys create, uh, extend his uh, upper chain, and then uh, exposed create an additional three, three blocks in the lower chain, and this basically creates uh, uh, two paths that are both of length six, and they, they, uh, uh, the, only uh, the only block in the intersection of these paths is the genesis block. So this shows that this string, this particular string of length nine, is forkable, uh, even though it only contains one third of adversarial slots. So this is, this is, uh, uh, this is a bit worrying. When it means that uh, the analysis uh, will be uh, will be quite involved, uh, and what uh, actually what one can uh, observe uh, quite easily is that no string of density less than one third is forkable. So this is like a corner case. Uh, the adversary needs at least one third of uh, of ones in the string to be able to 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 create such a fork. Uh, so if we were aiming for one third uh, security, we would be basically done quite easily. But, uh, but what, we, what, we, what Ouroboros is aiming for is a security up to, up to uh, adversaries that contain any, honest, uh, any, any arbitrarily large minority of, uh, of the stake. And this, this turns out to be much more involved. So, uh, of course, one can observe that uh, if the adversary controls more than one half of the, of the slots, the string is clearly forkable because the adversary can just ignore whatever the honest guys do and do his own stuff and uh, make it as long as he, at least as long as the honest parties. Uh, but what is interesting is this space between one third and one half. Uh, and to be able to say something about it, we need to, to argue probabilistically. So we have to, uh, to count in the distribution of these uh, forkable strings, this binomial distribution that I told you about, and ask the question, what is the probability that this, a particular string that is sampled from this distribution will be forkable in this sense of this definition? Uh, and this is, a, this is a question that is answered uh, already in the Ouroboros paper, uh, but the, uh, a stronger bound is achieved by Russell et al. in a particular write-up that you can find on ePrint. Uh, in, the way, uh, in the sense of this theorem, which says that if we draw this bit string from a binomial distribution with uh, this parameter one minus epsilon over two, which corresponds to the, to the, to the relative stake of the adversary, then um, the probability that this string is forkable decreases exponentially with the length of the string. Uh, and this together with the reduction theorem that basically says that if a bit string permits uh, uh, common prefix violation, then there must be a forkable uh, substring of a particular length somewhere in the, in the bit string. This together with the theorem and the via union bound, of course, give, uh, gives us the desired result that uh, the common prefix violation can also be upper bounded by a similar exponential bound. So I will briefly, I will briefly talk about uh, how this theorem is, is proven. Uh, it's via Martingale argument. Uh, and the relevant feature that, we, that uh, needs to be looked at is a two-dimensional quantity that tries to capture some properties of the longest chain so far. Uh, so it's a quantity that evolves as, as, the, as we are processing the bit string, and it captures the, uh, the, some properties of uh, the longest chain in, uh, so far in this, uh, in this tree and the second longest chain. These are the, it turns out it's sufficient to look at these two. Uh, of course, they, they may change throughout the, the running of the experiment, but uh, it's such a two-dimensional quantity. Uh, I will now try to show you what this quantity is, so let's introduce some, hopefully, uh, intuitive terms for that. So uh, if we look at a, at a fork like this one uh, in the picture below, the, and we look at a particular uh, uh, path in it, uh, let's, let's look at the path uh, denoted by T 
that's the 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 one uh, uh, the the upper one. Then the gap of t is uh, simply the difference in the length of this path from the length from the longest path uh, that is present in the fork. So, for example, the gap of t is four. Uh, the reserve uh, of this path is the number of adversarial slots that follow after the end of this path t. Uh, so, in this case, it's three because the adversary has three slots at his disposal after the end of this uh, of this path. Why is this important? Because if the adversary decides uh, that he wants to do so, he can extend t by at most three blocks uh, just uh, whenever he wants because he has control over these slots, right? And and the reach of t is simply the difference between the reserve and the gap. And and the intuition uh, is that uh, the reach of a particular path tells us uh, how much can the adversary extend this path uh, if he wants to with respect or relative to the longest path in the in the in the fork, right? So in this case, the reach is minus one, which means if, that if the adversary wants to uh, make the path, uh, it tries to make the path as long as possible, it would, he could extend it to, to be one block shorter than the longest path in the, in the fork. Uh, and we can go one level higher and look up at the particular fork and say that the reach of the whole fork, so remember the fork is just this, this tree, uh, is the maximum of all reach values for all the paths in the fork. And the margin of the fork is the second best disjoint reach. So, so the, the reach of the second longest completely disjoint path in, in this tree. Uh, and then even one level higher, we can talk about a particular string, characteristic string. And we say we define these two quantities, uh, rho and mu, where rho is the maximum reach over all forks that are compatible with this string. So if you have a string, you have a set of all forks that, uh, that uh, belong to, uh, to, this, to this bit string, to this characteristic string. And rho is the maximum reach of all of them. And uh, mu is the maximum margin of all of them. And then not so difficult to see fact is that, uh, that a characteristic string is forkable if and only if the, the mu quantity turns out to be non-negative for the, for the whole uh, bit string. This is intuitively, this is because it means that if the, there exists a fork for the particular string in which if the adversary wants, he can extend the second longest uh, uh, disjoint chain uh, to the length of the longest disjoint chain, which means he can produce two histories that are of the same length and they fork at the beginning, uh, which means uh, he can puzzle all the honest parties and uh, violate uh, persistence. Uh, and uh, so what, uh, what we want to achieve is to show that uh, with this distribution of the, of the characteristic string, the probability that mu is non-negative is, uh, is negligible. And the idea that is, uh, that is followed in that paper is to analyze this power as random variables, well, for this distribution of, of W. And uh, uh, with some work, one can show that uh, actually these two quantities inductively follow a particular uh, recursive expansion that I show you here, how, how these two quantities evolve uh, if you add a zero or a one to the end of the, to the, end of the string. And uh, you can actually define a related martingale to, to these random variables, uh, uh, lambda and mu. Uh, okay, it, it should be actually rho and mu. Uh, and uh, then uh, you can apply Azuma inequality to this martingale and this will give you the, the result I will know not go into, into that, but uh, uh, I hope this at least gives you the intuition of how the proof goes. And this concludes the proof of common prefix, uh, thanks to the reduction that, uh, that I already mentioned too. Okay, uh, so, so this was about uh, common prefix, chain growth and uh, chain quality. And uh, I will just uh, uh, mention that of course, persistence and liveness follow from these uh, three properties uh, in a quite standard way. Uh, Okay, so this establishes that the static, the static uh, part of the protocol, which only describes one epoch, does achieve persistence and liveness as we wanted, uh, in, uh, and this can be uh, formally established. Uh, but now we, we need to somehow bootstrap and get to the to the dynamic protocol, where uh, where one epoch follow one epoch follows another. Uh, and for this, as I said, we need, we need randomness. Uh, we need updated randomness for the new, for the new uh, epoch to be, to be used for sampling the slot leader, slot leader schedule. 
And uh, what Ouroboros does is uh, it uses a secure multi-party computation uh, uh, protocol to generate this randomness uh, with using the blockchain itself during this epoch as the communication medium. Uh, and the randomness that is then generated is guaranteed to be clean as long as the majority of the stakeholders or the slot leaders for that particular epoch are honest. Uh, and the tool that we use for this protocol is a uh, publicly verifiable secret sharing, where, which is a protocol where, uh, with a dealer and a family of players, uh, where the dealer can choose a value and uh, uh, share it to produce shares for each of, the, each of the players. And then players can both check whether the broadcasted shares are valid in the sense that together they, they really reflect the consistent value. And uh, also, if it is valid, then the majority of the players can reconstruct this value, but the minority of the players can learn nothing about the value. And this is very useful for the goal that we have because uh, we can simply make the parties uh, uh, use PVSS to share a random string that they generate. And after all, the, and also what we do for efficiency reasons is that uh, the parties also commit to this string. Uh, and after all these commitments are, are uh, put into the blockchain, uh, the players simply open the commitments and uh, XOR the values to get the new randomness. But if someone uh, fails to open his commitment, uh, then the PVSS shares can be used to reconstruct his value. And, uh, uh, and in this way, uh, uh, achieve the, the clean randomness for the next, for the next epoch. Right? Uh, uh, when it comes to practicality of Ouroboros, it was actually implemented by IOHK as a as the consensus algorithm underlying Cardano. Uh, uh, there are several ways how one can look at, uh, at the performance. One, one that is also presented in, in the paper is that uh, one can com uh, compare how much time one needs uh, in minutes to, to achieve 99.9% .9 assurance against an adversary that is trying uh, to make a double spending attack, uh, where in, Uro in the case of Ouroboros we can we can model this attack. We can do actually the optimal attack that the adversary can do for, for a double spending. This follows from the, from the, from the, from the uh, four calculus that I showed you. In the case of uh, Bitcoin, we, we only do the, the double spending attack that, that uh, you would expect, the, the simple one. Uh, so potentially there are better attacks against, against Bitcoin, but this already this attack is sufficient to show that actually this comparison turns out uh, uh, significantly in favor of uh, Ouroboros. Uh, so you can see several, uh, you can see how this, this turns out for various val values of the adversarials, either stake ratio or computational power ratio. Uh, and there are two columns for Ouroboros. One is the general one, which is uh, assuming an arbitrary adversary. That's what we have done so far. But the other one, which I think is, uh, is relevant for practice, uh, as well, or maybe even more, is uh, assuming a covered adversary, which is a weaker adversary that doesn't want to uh, give away that he behaves adversarially. So for example, he's not willing to sign two blocks that would belong into the same slot, uh, because that would clearly identify him as uh, being malicious. Uh, and there might be some uh, out-of-band ways to, to punish him. Or, uh, this is not specified in the protocol, but, but uh, there mi uh, it might be undesirable for the adversary to give away that uh, he doesn't follow the protocol. And if he decides to operate in such a covered way, the, the guarantees are, of course, even stronger. Um, okay, uh, so that much for Ouroboros. And uh, let me now describe how Prowse differs from Ouroboros and uh, what are the goals that uh, we had in mind when trying to design Prowse and how do we achieve these goals. So in a nutshell, uh, Prowse is an improved version of Ouroboros that uh, achieves security uh, in a semi-synchronous communication model, and despite full, uh, fully adversarial uh, adaptive corruption. So these are two uh, goals that uh, Ouroboros achieves, and the, the tools that are used to, to achieve these goals are uh, local and private leader selection, uh, forward secure signatures, and using hashing to obtain randomness. Uh, uh, and I will now go into, into the details of both of these, uh, these goals that we achieve, and all the three met tools that we use to achieve them and hopefully give you in a limited time a, a brief overview of how Prowse differs from, from Ouroboros. So 
you can see these two goals that, that we have listed up here as basically strengthening of the adversarial powers in the model that we are analyzing Ouroboros in. So the first strengthening is that we assume semi-synchronous communication. So uh, the black text on the slide is uh, simply the slide that was describing the communication model for Ouroboros in the original paper. And the red uh, text highlights the differences in, uh, in the model in which we look at Prowse. So now we still have slots, but, uh, but the honest players are only guaranteed that the messages from them are delivered to other honest players within at most delta slots, so with some delay. And this delay has, is fully controlled by the adversary. Individually for each, each message and each recipient, the adversary can decide how this message will be delayed. And uh, this bound delta is unknown to the, pro to the protocol, so uh, the parties cannot, uh, cannot exploit the knowledge of delta. And what we show is that the security of Prowse provably degrades gracefully with increasing delta. Of course, you, with increasing, with worse and worse network, you cannot uh, maintain the same security and performance, but it degrades uh, gracefully, which is not, this did not follow from the analysis of Ouroboros, uh, because the, that analysis only assumed synchronous communication. And the second strengthening that we, uh, that we make, uh, strengthening of the adversary, is that it can make uh, immediate corruptions. Uh, so it can just, uh, at any point in the execution of the protocol, it can corrupt any party and immediately obtain all of its, uh, all of its memory, including its secret keys, and act uh, on behalf of that party. This is, was also something that uh, not only was uh, not captured by the, by the model of, of the original Ouroboros paper, but also would be disastrous for the protocol. Uh, because because once the once the slot leader schedule is public, the adversary could just corrupt the slot leaders, and uh, he could uh, he could hijack the chain. So the only restrictions that the adversary still needs to uh, to obey is that uh, it still only can corrupt a minority of the stake throughout the the experiment, and uh, we still assume that the stake shifts are happening at a bounded rate. So this is the second strengthening that uh, uh, that we apply to the model. And the three tools that we are using to be able to prove uh, persistence and liveness also in this doubly strengthened model is, uh, so the first tool is uh, that we use local private leader selection. Remember in Ouroboros, we chose the, the leader schedule publicly. Uh, here we don't do it. We use a tool called verifiable random functions, which is a cryptographic primitive that basically co uh, consists of two uh, Procedures. One is called evaluate. It, so VRFs are like a public uh, public key uh, cousins of PRFs or pseudo random functions. Um, and so the first uh, the first uh, uh, procedure called evaluate uh, needs the secret key of the uh, and uh, using the secret key it uh, and it takes an input and produces the corresponding output, which is unique for this input and this key. Uh, it looks pseudo random to anyone who doesn't know the secret key. And uh, the function also produces a proof so that the party owning the secret key can convince anyone else that this is indeed the output uh, for that corresponding input and the secret key. And then, of course, there is a second verify procedure that allows, allows you, if you only uh, control the public key, it allows you to check that for a particular input, uh, the corresponding output and proof are correct. So this is a VRF. And you can use it in a natural way to, to get a leader selection lottery for a uh, for deciding uh, slot leaders in a, in a local and private way. So every stakeholder simply has a, his own secret key for a, for a VRF, and he just plugs into this VRF the randomness for that epoch and the, the slot number and looks at the output. And if the output is smaller than some threshold that, uh, that is derived from his uh, particular stake ratio, uh, if it is smaller, then, uh, then he's just a, he's a leader for that slot. An interesting point here is that this function uh, phi that, uh, that uh, creates the threshold from your, from your stake needs to be sublinear uh, uh, with respect to the stake, as opposed to the case in Ouroboros where, the, where the, the slot leader attribution was public, because if, if, if it is public, you can, you can actually make it uh, linearly proportional to, to your stake. But that's not the case uh, in the... Uh, in the private leader selection case, if you want to maintain uh, in what we call in independent aggregation, which means that if you have a particular pile of stake 
uh, it doesn't help you to split the stake into several piles and pretend that you are several players uh, to increase your chances of becoming a leader. If we want to maintain this property, then the function actually needs to be sublinear. So we have such a function in Prowls. Uh, a similar construction was also used previously in the NXT uh, cryptocurrency and also in Algorand for, uh, for doing private leader selection. Uh, it's actually not enough to use an arbitrary vanilla VRF, a generic one, because we need some uh, security also in case when the keys of the VRF are adversarially generated because every player will be generating the keys for himself. So we don't want uh, corrupted players to be able to win, to cheat the leader selection lottery by uh, improperly generating the VRF keys. Uh, but in the paper, we give a UC functionality of a VRF uh, that is sufficient for this, for this task. And we also give an efficient realiz realization of it, uh, uh, assuming random oracles and computational Diffie-Hellman assumption. And what is interesting about this local and private leader election is that it produces empty slots and multi-leader slots because now the, the, the leader's uh, selection cannot be like synchronized throughout the, the, all the parties. So if every party decides locally whether he or she is a slot leader, it means that there will be slots that uh, contain no leaders and there will be slots that contain several leaders. And uh, to analyze this and show that persistence and liveness is uh, is still maintained, uh, we need to make a, an extension of the fork of the strings analysis. I will not go into how we do it, but uh, uh, we do it in the Prowse paper. And uh, interestingly now, the ratio of empty slots, uh, basically how many slots turn out to have no slot leader, uh, is a protocol parameter, that's, and it will be hidden in this, in this phi uh, function. And uh, this actually uh, turns out to be useful because uh, such short uh, leaderless periods help us uh, in the analysis uh, uh, in the semi-synchronous setting because they kind of allow parties to synchronize when over the, the short periods of silence. Uh, and uh, it's important also to, to mention that uh, this doesn't degrade performance because now we can aim for much shorter slots because our assumption is not that messages will be delivered within uh, the slot as it was the case for Ouroboros. Uh, and the second tool that we use uh, in Prowse is uh, our key evolving signatures. These are uh, digital signature schemes with a special property where uh, the public keys uh, are, are fixed but the secret keys can be evolved uh, in such a way that uh, you can update it in every step. In our case, that would be every slot. And uh, even if you get hold of someone's secret key for a particular slot, you are not able to forge signatures for previous slots. So if any party, uh, if a party uh, deletes its, uh, its, uh, its older uh, secret keys as, as it is uh, prescribed by the protocol, uh, before broadcasting uh, any messages, even when, when it acts as a slot leader in a particular slot, then even if the party gets immediately corrupted by the adversary, uh, the adversary can no longer create blocks in, uh, in, the, uh, in the name of this party for past slots and for this slot, because the keys are already delete, deleted or evolved. And uh, this helps us to, to manage, to achieve adaptive security, to manage with the adversary that is allowed to do uh, immediate corruptions. So such a, key, uh, such a key evolving signature scheme is used for signing blocks in Prowse. And we also give a UC functionality uh, for, uh, for uh, key evolving signatures that is uh, sufficient for this role and, uh, and we give a realization of it. And the final tool that I want to mention is that uh, Prowse also moves away from the MPC to, to, for generating the randomness for, for the next epoch for slot leader selection. Uh, what it does instead is again turning to hashing because it's much more efficient. But uh, recall that there was this basic complaint against hashing, which is uh, that uh, the adversary can do rejection sampling. And uh, to prevent this, what we do is that into every block, we include an additional VRF value from the leader. So if you turn out to be a leader producing a block, you also include a particular VRF value using your secret key for the VRF. And these values are hashed together uh, from, from the whole past epoch to create the randomness for the next epoch uh, at, one, at one shot. And this means that if 
with, with clean randomness the, the next epoch, thanks to the static analysis, uh, there, would be, there would be only a negligible probability of uh, violating, say, common prefix or any other of the desired properties. Then an adversary who is able to do rejection sampling polynomially many times cannot increase this probability uh, sufficiently to make it non-negligible. The actual bound in the paper is uh, much more nuanced, but, uh, but even this argument is sufficient on the asymptotic level. Okay? Uh, right. So uh, these are the three, three main differences of, uh, of Prowse compared to Ouroboros, and the two, the two uh, goals that we achieve by, the, by these three changes. Uh, I will not go into further details, and I will, uh, if you are interested in uh, any additional details, just uh, either look into the papers that are all on imprint, or ask me, and uh, with this I will finish the talk. So thank you for your attention.